One of our panellists, unfortunately, uh, for travel reasons, couldn't be here. So he's watching on the webcast. So I don't know, Simon, if you can see this, but um, we all miss you and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get you to the next uh, Internet Governance Forum. Um, some of you may have attended this event last year at the Rio IGF. And if you were at that session, you'll remember that we had far min too many questions than could be answered. And the panelists, all the panelists, in fact, were cornered at the end of the session with people asking them questions about how to set up internet exchange points. So we thought it would be a very good idea to continue that discussion at this IGF. And again, we've assembled, assembled a panel with a great deal of expertise. Um, my name's Sam Paltridge. I'm from the OECD. Um, in the last year, I've been kept busy with an OECD ministerial in which uh, the ministers themselves recognise the importance of internet exchange points. And ministers don't often focus on the granular detail of technology and uh, technical infrastructure, but it was one of the things that they thought was essential for the development of the internet. Um, and of course, most OECD countries, if not all, or at least most of them, have internet exchange points and have had them for a long time, but I believe there's still about half the world's countries, or more than half, that don't have internet exchange points. I know Bill's going to update us on, Bill Woodcock from Packet Clearinghouse is going to update us on developments over the last year and how um, th the number of internet exchange points is developing, and I, Bill's going to demo a live website, which is always exciting in a session. Um, so hopefully all the technology works, but uh, that will be very informative. I've looked at that site and it has a great deal of information about internet exchange points. Um, we've got a very interesting panel um, from a wide variety of, of countries. Um, in the order they speak, we have Bill Woodcock from Packet Clearinghouse, who many of you will know very well. Bill set up a lot of IXPs around the world. Uh, we then move to Lebanon, Salam Yumut who's been uh, very active in uh, setting up internet infrastructure in Lebanon in their reconstruction. And this is almost not starting from zero, but almost starting from, from, from less than zero, if I could put it that way. So a very challenging environment, and we'll hear the story of their internet exchange point. Um, sitting in for Sumon is Sebastian Bellagamba. Uh, from the Internet Society, who was involved in setting up the Argentinian Internet Exchange Point. And last but not least, Machiki Mwangi uh, from the Kenyan IXP, uh, one, of the, one of the best IXPs uh, in the world, as I'm sure Machiki will tell us some, some real success stories built around that Internet Exchange Point. So without further ado, each of the speakers is going to take about 15 minutes. Um, I will take one or two questions of clarification after each speaker if there are any, and they've all promised me to stick to their time, so we should have about 30 minutes for discussion at the end. So I'll hand over to Bill Woodcock. Bill. Hello, all. Um, as uh, Sam said, I'm going to try to use a website through the notoriously cranky uh, internet connection that we've had here at the uh, conference. So. Uh, what you're looking at on the screen here is uh, live database output on our website uh, of a directory of internet exchange points and uh, the dots on the map are locations of internet exchange points and there's a table under that of the 300 exchange points in the world. Um, and these are all sortable by different criteria, like for instance if you want to see by traffic, and now we see whether we can actually load a, yes, looks like we're loading a web page, good. Uh, so we can sort by traffic, you know, high to low or low to high, and uh, in a moment then I will go on to talking about the differences between where we stood last year and where we stand right now. Um, <coughs> Sorry, uh, this is, this is a little this slow. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so basically uh, what Sam suggested I do was give you an update um, 
looking at the difference between uh, where we were this time last year when we all met in Rio and where we are now. Um, this map and table here is sorted by uh, volume of traffic. So you see um, uh, Amsterdam and Frankfurt and London at the top of that list and then uh, on down through uh, big Korean and Japanese exchanges and so forth. Um, but what I would like to focus on is these summary views. Uh, and all this, of course, is live, so you can go back and look at it any time yourself. Uh, let me bump up the size of the text there. Um, so at the moment, there are 110 countries that don't have ex an exchange point at all, and 86 that have one or more exchange points. This is sorted by number of exchanges in each country. Um, the United States, of course, has a lot, but it's also a very large area. Europe has more exchange points than the United States in a smaller area, so is actually most dense, but because it's broken up into separate countries, uh, if you count it by country rather than by region, um, it doesn't look as dense on a map, unfortunately. Um, so what we want to take a look at here are the annualized growth numbers Look, the, yes, the internet is still here. Okay, so this is by region and number of internet exchange points and amount of bandwidth being produced in those exchange points. So let's look first at uh, net change. Uh, Europe, over the course of the last year, added 14 new exchange points. The Asia Pacific and North America each added four. Latin America added three and to the best of uh, our knowledge, there were no new exchange points opened in Africa in the last year. Uh, by percent of change, uh, Latin America grew at 14%. I mean, that, that three relative, sorry, the three growth relative to 21 a year ago is 14% growth. Uh, uh, Europe about the same proportionally and Asia Pacific and North America at a slightly lower growth rate. In terms of net change in amount of bandwidth produced per country in, in exchange points, uh, there was almost one terabyte of growth in uh, the, hmm, those numbers don't quite add up. I'm not exactly sure why, I will check into that. But <clears throat> Uh, suffice it to say, there was a lot of growth in Europe and uh, somewhat less in, again, North America and the Asia Pacific region, and uh, then again, an order of magnitude step down to Latin America, and uh, one more order of magnitude uh, lower growth rate in Africa in terms of absolute numbers. However, uh, by percentage, it's almost the opposite. Uh, Africa had 224% growth rate as a continent, which is really quite astounding, uh, given that there are a lot of sort of historical, the historical rule of thumb has been that the internet kind of doubles in size every year. Um, and so if you're more than doubling in size, you're gaining relative to the rest of the world. And if you're less than doubling in size, you might be falling behind rest, relative to the rest of the world. Uh, Europe at 64%, um, Latin America and North America at about 50%, and the Asia Pacific region at 11% growth. Uh, let's drill in by country, and uh, you'll see why Machuki has such a reason to be proud of the Nairobi exchange, which went from 14 megabytes uh, megabits per second of bandwidth uh, in December of 2007 to 65 for the last year, almost 400% growth over the last year. Uh, South Africa, likewise, uh, almost tripled in size last year uh, as they liberalized some of the policies around their exchange point. Uh, so between those two, they're driving the entire African continent to a higher growth rate than anywhere else in the world. Um, but of course, those are on small totals. Um, 
which does make it easier to get a large growth rate. Um, Germany, the Netherlands, UK, again, are the top three in terms of largest net change. The United States is smaller than any of those three, uh, obviously much less the, the combination of them or the rest of Europe. Uh, Japan by itself is uh, relatively close to U.S. Um, and uh, Sweden, uh, we have the operators of the Sweden exchange, Swedish exchanges uh, here in the room with us as well. So um, that's basically what I have in terms of an update. Uh, we don't have too many new exchanges over the course of the last year. Um, you'll be, oh, sorry, actually, let me think if I do like, yeah, there. Um, uh, we've got one in Lithuania, one in Haiti, uh, the one in Lebanon that Salam will be telling you about, uh, one in the Dominican Republic. Um, so only four new ones this year that I know of. Um, I guess, uh, let's see, that's only been 10 minutes so far. Uh, why don't I uh, give Salam a little bit more time and uh, unless there are any questions on this first. No? Okay. Uh. So thanks, Bill. So I'm Salam Yamut from Lebanon. I work for Cisco and I'm here to tell you uh, why Cisco got involved into helping create, create the first internet exchange point in Lebanon, the second in the Middle East, and how we did it. So uh, in 2006, uh, we had a brutal war with uh, Israel in which a lot of the infrastructure was destroyed. And uh, uh, Cisco got together with other uh, companies like Microsoft, Intel, Oxy, Gafari, and others. Uh, to do a reconstruction and economic uh, development, economic and social development of Lebanon. So our, uh, we wanted to help the people of Lebanon find the path to long-term stability and economic growth. And uh, more specifically, Cisco led then on help to rebuild the ICT infrastructure of Lebanon. So uh, in Lebanon, for example, we don't have broadband. Uh, we don't have speeds in the home more than one megabits per second. And uh, ex uh, internet is very, very expensive. And like the E1 line nationally uh, sells for like $3,000 a month. So we have a lot of problems there. And uh, within the partnership for Lebanon, we try to, to find ways on how we can kickstart that ICT infrastructure. And one of the ways, of course, was to try to create an internet exchange point in Lebanon. So uh, the governance mechanism of the Partnership for Lebanon is always to look for partners to partner with, with local partners also, to try to make the impact. And in this case, we work with many uh, people, the Professional Association of Lebanon, which is the agglomeration of all the ICT uh, companies. We identified uh, Bill Woodcock of the Packet Clearinghouse as an in international neutral uh, expertise. Uh, Cisco, we got Cisco to donate the equipment, and we got Beritech, which is an incubator to host the, uh, the internet exchange point. So uh, it all uh, took us eight months from beginning to start. Uh, if you look at the timeline, you'll find uh, Bill with other people came and visited Lebanon in May of 2007 and had a series of meetings with government officials, stakeholders, incumbent, a whole bunch of people, made sure that it's something that Lebanese people wanted and that it could be done. And then we spent about six months just hugging each other, getting to know each other, because of course the ISPs wouldn't speak to each other, they wouldn't trust each other. Um, I'll tell you more about the challenges, but most of the time of the eight months was done just, you know, eating pizza together, talking, and, you know, at the end of six months, we felt comfortable that they, the ISPs uh, felt comfortable that there was neutral bodies involved, that there were people trying to really help them do their best interest, so, and things very quickly in December just happened. Uh, Bill came back for... Uh, for one day to do a, a workshop in half a day. And that same day in the afternoon, three, the, the first three ISPs got uh, connected. Uh, one thing about the location, the six months 
every meeting we had, we talked about the location because every time we met and we came to discuss the location, of course, every ISP said, why don't we put it at my place? And then uh, in Lebanon, since the ISPs were very much afraid of, of the incumbent, of the government, of everything, then they finally, uh, the only location that was acceptable to them is the incubator, which is located on a little hill above Beirut, so they felt safe to be within a university, to be away from the center. They felt safe that it's a neutral location. This is only how they decided to, to be peering together when they were given the assurance that nobody will come and pull, pull the plug. And uh, in April of 2008, all ISPs were on board except for the incumbent. And uh, we had a big party. And ever since, we had, uh, we had one major university now appearing at the IXP and another very large, um, um, I don't know if I should say that correctly, illegal ISP because we have those in Lebanon too, also started appearing at the ISP. So the ISPs are now aware of the value of the internet exchange point and are willing to get people that have lots of traffic to peer with them uh, at that location. So eight months is good in a country like Lebanon. I, you know, uh, especially that six months were done, as I said, talking and hugging uh, each other. Uh, the major uh, challenges we encountered was a relationship with the incumbent. So we talked to them first, they said, yes, they'll peer with us. And then they said, no, they can't peer with us. And then they said, no, you can't have fiber. So we had to, uh, the ISPs by this time were determined to go ahead and they decided to do uh, optical links and microwave links to reach uh, the location from their data centers. So uh, we were very happy to reach a point of no return, but then we had to do it without the help of the incumbent, without fiber, without encouragement and with fear because the incumbents threatened to, uh, to unhook them, threatened to delay the equipment at the, at the border. So what we had to do is uh, we used one uh, Cisco switch from the lab, another ISP had a, a spare switch. We got the switches together, we got the IXP running with, the, with the, not the right equipment because we were, we were assured that the equipment will stay at the airport for six, three months, which it did, you know, so we started without them. So this was a major challenge, a major cause of stress. Uh, the other challenge we face is location, location, again location, but I explained that earlier we were able to find a neutral, far away, secure one. We started there. The third challenge is, I want to call it the CIO versus the CEO, because uh, in the first meeting, first all CEOs of the ISPs were bought. They're on board, they're like, when can we try this thing? You know, yes, sure, let's try it. And the CEOs were like, oh, no, 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 do we have the right formal entity? Do we need to set up a company? Do we need to set up an NGO? Uh, do we need to, uh, are, are the government going to shut us down? Is the incumbent not gonna, you know? These questions were on the mind of CEO. What do I have to sign? How much is it gonna cost me? And here I'd like to say that the model we followed in Lebanon is the plain vanilla PCH model. That means it's a model that has no cost attached to it, that has no formal entity. The management and operation committee are three people, uh, three people elected from the ISPs themselves. So it's a very light structure where the only person that is really making money is the, the location, the incubator in this case, and which we agreed with them to, uh, for the first 15 entrants that they will give at, at a cost, uh, uh, that their cost only, which was $2,500 a year, which we thought was very good deal for, for the ISPs. So the ISPs cost is really just the link between their data center and that location and the $2,500 a year, which is not bad. So. Uh, so we took the, the light uh, approach to, uh, to internet exchange point, knowing that in the future, would we become bigger? Would we need to do something else? We can always change. And the last challenge we, failed, uh, we faced is documentation. It's not really a challenge, but I'd like to point it out here, because when we do multi-stakeholder uh, projects with a lot of people, with a lot of ISPs, it is important always to document, to publish, to be accountable, to be transparent. And this is not in the Lebanese culture. So it was something to meet, but then we had to really push hard to say, no, we need these minutes on the website. Why should people look at our minutes of meeting? Why should we publish them on the website? So it was a lot of talk before we all agreed that, no, it's important to have a website. It's important to put all the information on it. When the IXP is up, when the IXP is down, 
who are the new members, who are the things that are, uh, what are the things that are really issues for the IXP and for the public. Statistics, for example, we stayed in negotiation for one month before we put the statistics of the Beirut IX on the website. But now it is, you can go look at it. And uh, again, we succeeded at that. So the challenges for the future is again the relationship with the incumbent. It controls about 50% uh, thirty percent of the traffic in Lebanon, so we very much would like them to be with us, so we have to work on that and uh, promoting the Beirut IX nationally and regionally, what does that mean? That means that this is a great potential for a country like Lebanon that wishes to be a, a data hub or an internet hub in the region. So the internet exchange point is the foundation is the absolute foundation for such a project. So what we need to do, there are things we can do to do that. First, we have to increase traffic. We have to encourage content providers to come to the IXP and peer there. And to do that, like the universities, like the web hosting companies, like the, um, the graphics designers, etc. And in order to do that, we have to show to these businesses that what the business case is from being at the IXP. How would they operate? How would they make money? or? at least save money by being at the IX. We have to attract uh, the .lb registry and other applications and services. So again, the traffic is, uh, is heightened. And we also have to lobby with the government to make them understand that you know, the private sector has done something nice in Lebanon. It's up to them now to use it if they have uh, national inspirations to make that internet exchange point a hub, a data hub, an internet hub uh, for Lebanon and the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salam. Is there any uh, burning questions of clarification? Otherwise, we'll go to our next speaker. Uh, I don't see anyone jumping up. So, uh, Sebastian, please, yeah. the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bergamba. I'm, I'm representing here the Argentinian IXP. Actually, I uh, will tell you a story of uh, an earlier story of IXPs in, in, in developing countries. Um, I think it was one of, of the first IXPs in, in developing countries that we have. Actually, competing inside Latin America, we being the second to the Brazilian IXP by a month or something like that, in two projects that we didn't know each other. So we were not actually competing, but mm -hmm. they won. They, be, they beat us, us for a month. We still complain about it. And um, uh, for those of you who are interested in soccer, Brazil and Argentina don't get along very well, so competing in that was also an issue. And um, it's a, I, I would I expect a particular case because it's a, we have to develop a lot of new models and rules, and we didn't have packet clearing house, for instance, in order to inspire ourselves for setting up this IXP. We have to, we we had to improvise at, the, at that point in time. So with th that characteristic makes the Argentinian IXP a very particular one which good things and bad things, and we are trying to, to fix it up. I, I will try to, to, to uh, pinpoint uh, several particularities of our IXP because uh, our basic model has been presented in the, in the past I, uh, IGF. So um, I will tell about this story for those of you that didn't attend Rio de Janeiro, that uh, our IXP was set on 1998. Uh, was set inside the Argentinian ISP Association, and we decided to host it inside our own facilities, the IXP, in order to, to get that neutrality that my colleague was referring to, which is uh, essential for running a successful ISP. IXP, sorry. Um, we decided to go to a model which was a co cooperative model in which the expenses are shared between the, the, the participants, and you don't have to pay a fee. That's what I mean. You don't pay by traffic either. You, and there is a membership fee the time you decide to connect to the IXP, and uh, from that point on, what you do is you share the expenses in a, with a, some um, mechanism we, decide, we already decide transparently and, and in, in our meetings to apply for, for sharing these expenses. Um, we decided that uh, several characteristics of uh, the, I, the IXP based on the need of involve the incumbents at, at that point in time. And we were 
we, we were uh, really, we had to make a, a compromise in order to, to get them inside. This t uh, turned out to be a sad story because I, I will tell you later that the incumbents ended up leaving the IXP. But we had to make a compromise in the, in the beginning. At least this situation lasted for uh, five years. Uh, one of the compromises we had to make is um, we were uh, um, allowing to interconnect in the IXP only license holders in Argentina. That means excluding those that are not um, a licensee of telecommunications, which basically are the content providers, for instance, or the commercial companies, or even the government. Uh, yeah, it's, there, there is another co compromise. I, I will go train. Uh, we require an ASN number because it's obvious for VGP reasons. And um, the, as Bill was, was telling me, um, we required only to exchange national traffic to exclude international routes from, from our VGP sessions. And that is another commitment we had to make with uh, uh, regional carriers in order to get them connected to the IXP. They don't want this IXP to compete with their business of transporting data throughout the region. Um, and we decided to go with, uh, we are not talking in this workshop uh, about the models, different models of IXPs, but uh, there is several, I would say there's basically two models of, of IXP. One is multilateral agreements or bilateral peering agreements. And we choose because of this situation, which is to go with a expanded form of multilateral agreements, which is a mandatory multilateral agreements. Everyone has to interconnect with everyone if you decide to, to, to connect to the IXP. Has this is good and bad, has pros and cons. I can go further on that if you, if you want in the question and answers uh, period. I don't wanna take time on, on that. So uh, our main target at that point in time was to, to include the, the incumbents in the, into the IXP. And we were successful. And uh, as I said, we were successful for five years. Suddenly, they decided to leave. They decided to leave in, in a worst way possible. And they strangled the IXP in, in order to get away of the SLA, uh, of the IXP with no harm, you know. So we had a situation in which, for several months in Argentina, every single IX, ISP was, or, or carrier, national carrier was connected to the IXP. Our, um, our uh, peering agreement was mandatory, so we cannot go other route. And these people were just downgrading their the links to the, to the IXP. So the connectivity we got from, from them was very, very poor. And we cannot get rid of it because we, were, we had a contract signed that we, are, we were um, mandated to go through the IXP and to publish and to try this way in order to interconnect to, to the networks. That was a very funny situation. I would say funny now. It wasn't funny at that point in time. And in Argentina, we have two incumbents. It's a very particular country. Um, in, particularly in the capital city, Buenos Aires, we, it's the only point in the country where they compete. The, we have the two incumbents, and for the two incumbents, we split the country between north and south, and there is one incumbent in, in each region. But in the capital city, we have both of them. And with them, in this uh, process of uh, uh, sabotaging the, the IXP, uh, they got some allies, which included the biggest ISP and uh, another carrier. Uh, I would say it was a sad story at that point in time, but it turned out to, to be a good, a good move because it made us change in some way and, expand, uh, and made us expand our IXP in, in, in the long term. Um, two of them, not the incumbents, the other two uh, players are already back in the IXP, and our IXP has uh, actually grew in traffic and grew in members since since the departure of the two incumbents. Um, that is not to say that I recommend you to expel the incumbents from the IXP, but there is certain ways to avoid the damage. 
what we did, basically, we lifted several of these restraints we already put in place for, for seducing the, the, the incumbents. So uh, we now allow uh, non-licensees uh, to connect to the IXP. For instance, the content providers. Google, Google, for instance, is about to connect to the IXP because uh, the Latin American operation of Google is in Argentina. So not counting even the growth of traffic that Google will provide when they, they're connected, we are better off than, than, than before. The first one that made the really difference was the government through the Internal Revenue Service. They, because when the, this situation was happening, there were several casualties of the, I, the IXP strangling. The government, for instance, which uh, rely on the internet services, for instance, the, internet, the Internal Re Revenue Service relies heavily on, 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 um, the in on internet for, for their business, they, had, they were, was in the situation that they were not connected to the IXP, but they only got connectivity from the incumbents. And the incumbents were uh, strangling the non-incumbents networks. So the uh, citizens using the non-incumbents networks wouldn't, not, uh, wouldn't reach the, the, the Internal Revenue Service uh, website. So I, I would say that because of this was a mess, but uh, I, the, the whole country was a mess for a while, but um, we, we learned a lot from, from that experience. And um, what the Internal Revenue Service dis did is, okay, I don't want to repeat this situation anymore. I connect directly to the to the IXP, to the IXP, and I avoid the pos even the possibility of, the, of this situation to come back. And several other banks or critical or critical operations that, that depend on the internet, they did the same. Uh, our last move is to remove this mandatory multilateral uh, peering agreement. We are not longer requiring people to uh, falsely. Uh, interconnect with each other. Actually, we have, we run two virtual IXPs in the same time, at the same time, at the same place. One which is still mandatory, and the other one which is by the second big group, which is by bilateral peering agreements. And um, I think that would be it. I, I, want, I wanted just to, to have these points highlighted because uh, we had had a uh, bad experiences and they wanted to share and because if you are facing uh, the possibility of setting up a, an IXP you have to take care of the experience of the people that go wrong in some way in order to, to learn how to avoid this, this danger in the future. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much Sebastian. I know my, my colleagues that work in fiscal affairs and taxation <laughs> matters would be extremely interested in that anecdote because uh, <laughs> anything that stops uh, people paying their taxes is uh, um, not regarded well uh, <laughs> by governments. Uh, Michigo, I think some of those anecdotes <laughs> provide the perfect lead in to your experience. Um, you'll notice some similarities uh, and, yeah. and, and some things in common and, and we'll be interested to hear the Kenyan perspective. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, well, actually, the, we, we, we quite well resonate with some of those experiences. And um, of interest is that um, uh, when, the, when the, uh, the revenue authority, which is connected to the exchange point, was actually experiencing difficulties, it's because the incumbent was uh, at, at a loss of how to upgrade the, the link that they had, which was uh, just the equivalent of an E1, uh, two megabits, and the infrastructure that they had in place was just only scalable to multiple E1s uh, within the same circuit, uh, or, or rather using independent circuits. And uh, so uh, as they took time, uh, one of the things which was uh, which continues to be one of uh, KXP's main strength is that we have an outreach program which basically goes out to identify who are the new players, who, who is providing content, and we get to talk to them. We get to talk to various forums locally, and people are conscious of the fact that there exists an exchange point in the country. And uh, as, as they get to, to discuss in the process, they, uh, the opportunity is always presented to them that they have an option of not being frustrated 
through the connectivity process, uh, the connectivity that they are given by their upstream providers when it comes to local uh, uh, traffic. And uh, as it is, uh, we, we do have now banks. One of the banks which provides connectivity, uh, which provides the banking services to the revenue authority is actually connected to the exchange point, being the first bank because they experienced difficulties during the money transfers with the revenue authority for all the payments, and the, re uh, the revenue authority e had difficulty as well um, uh, with access for people who were not connected directly with, with the incumbent, uh, who happens to be their service provider. As with most government uh, installations will be that they get services from other government installations, and so they had one choice of them, of them going through the incumbent for their upstream connection. So going straight into my presentation, um, I wanted to just give us a, a brief background of um, uh, the situation as it is in Africa. Uh, we currently have uh, 17 exchange points in 15 African countries. That means uh, we have some countries with more than one exchange point, uh, being Tanzania. And uh, uh, as as has been the case in most uh, other African, uh, most other regions, the ISP associations have been the ones responsible for setting up exchange points. And um, uh, basically, the, the driving factor behind Africa is that there have been quite a huge and diverse challenge in, in, in terms of the telecoms industry, where there have been licensing uh, uh, and uh, challenges, monopoly, duopolies, and as a result of that, there's been a need to establish a way to bypass uh, all these challenges, some uh, going all the way to the infrastructure side where the costs are quite prohibitive. And uh, with that, you'll see that these, those are the countries we have, uh, the source from nsrc.org. Um, they collect the map of the countries which have exchange points. Um, and. Uh, as Bill had mentioned, we have the, uh, the traffic of about uh, 370 uh, megabits in, in total aggregate in Africa. I did a, a research earlier in the year and I was able to get responses from about 10 of these. Of the 17, we managed to get 10 uh, of them responding in terms of how much traffic they're passing. And you'll see an average total came to about 364 megabits per uh, 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 per second, and uh, you'll see South Africa there with the bulk of it. At the time, Kenya uh, was not as much as it is then. Uh, it was about 40 megabits. Um, and you'll see also Egypt is one of the other large countries, and the rest share uh, the smaller ones. Um, so the, the, the model that actually has driven most of the uh, exchange points to be established in Africa is because of um, the, the existing uh, uh, charges, mainly the charges, the cost of uh, providing internet connectivity uh, through transit. Now in that diagram, and um, I don't know how many of you were present on Monday's session on internet terminologies where we are talking about transit and peering, uh, where transit is uh, basically where you have to actually pay somebody to carry traffic to, uh, from, one, uh, from, one, from your network to another network. And that's basically the case. Uh, in, in this diagram, you have ISP blue and ISP green, and they are customers. And for them to reach the other, they have to send the traffic through an incumbent telco or through some license provider. Mainly, that's the case in Africa. And the interesting thing to note is that most of these transit providers or the telcos actually have peering agreements. That means by, by peering is where you're exchanging traffic without having to pay the other person. So you each pay for the costs of the halfway. Uh, to take the traffic from, uh, you pay for your half part of the link. And so um, as a result of that, they, it's basically at cost. That means they don't really exchange any money or any revenue for that exchange of traffic. So it's almost free for them to, uh, to deliver the packets across. Uh, but for you as uh, the, the ISP, you actually have to spend a lot of money. Uh, and in Africa, it ranges between $2,000 per month per megabit, and so if it, it is actually higher than $2,000 per month. This is the lowest figure I could place. And so um, as a result of that, what we've started to see is that uh, the establishment of exchange points have come up, but um, to start with, the pipes have actually been very small. They range from between 128K to about 1 meg, depending on the available local infrastructure. and. Uh, 
the objective and which is desired. So this is currently what you'll find in most of those uh, in the 17 exchange points that have uh, shown in those countries in Africa. They have small pipes to the exchange point and very big pipes, uh, anywhere starting from 10 megs and above to, to their upstream providers. Um, in the desired model would actually be to have bigger pipes in comparison uh, where, where, uh, where you're actually doing peering and to the exchange points uh, that's peering traffic basically. Uh, you need to have bigger pipes. That means most of your traffic should be going through exchange points and uh, uh, less uh, in comparison uh, the, 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 the links you have to the upstream should be sh should not be as big as the ones you have to the peering uh, points. And as a result, the other thing that happens is that once you draw as much traffic, that means you have 10 meg, uh, 100 meg, 1 gig uh, links to the exchange point, it means there's a lot of traffic. And the next thing that happens is you start attracting the telcos. And so the telcos will also uh, join the, the, the peering points with equally big pipes and mainly to just do peering uh, and not as much transit as, as, as would be the case in normal circumstances. Um, so the building blocks to getting here, because this, this ideally is what uh, creates the autonomy of having um, exchange points contribute to the overall growth and development of ICTs and, um, uh, in, in, in a country. Um, so one, there is the issue of neutrality, which, um, uh, which has been mentioned. There is a pairing policy, uh, which the multilateral versus bilateral, the pricing. Uh, the stability of the exchange point is quite important with regards to power, cooling, security, and also value-added services. I think, to me, one of the most important ones there is technical support. Can they actually call and get technical support uh, relating to their connection that they have uh, at the exchange point and also other internet resources like root servers. So going into the ex uh, KXP case, um, I guess uh, one of the first things we also did um, um, is opening up to non-traditional members. That means we also uh, opened up uh, to non-ISPs and that's where we're able to get on board the CCTLD, the Kenyan CCTLD um, content providers and um, also the, the revenue authority. Uh, the multi mandatory multilateral peering has been maintained, has not been changed, um, despite the fact that we look like the most successful. And this has been mainly to, um, to address a social peering uh, problem, you know, the big versus the small. So what happens is that the large players will choose not to peer all the traffic because they are, uh, you know, they are forced to peer with everybody um, in the mandatory process. They are actually forced to announce some of their prefixes to the exchange point. And as a result of that, we get at least some bit of traffic flowing as opposed to none at all. Um, there is also the implementation of value-added services in terms of uh, the root servers for uh, resilience and autonomy. That means if the upstream providers do experience difficulties, and in Kenya the main connection we have to the rest of the world is through satellite. So satellites do modems fail from time to time. We have uh, sun um, uh, issues relating to the alignment of the satellites and uh, outages and so those kind of things whenever they do occur it, it presents a level of continuity for local tra traffic which is uh, not dependent entirely on the international connections. We also reduce the costs of entry, uh, the barriers basically initially the cost of entry was pretty high above just about almost a thousand dollars and uh, this came to as low as 400 uh, to, for, for the initial entry and the monthly charges is at $250 per month and this is for a port that is between 10, 100 and a gig at the moment because that's the kind of switch we have. And we also continue to do the outreach and awareness that I mentioned earlier with full-time staff. Currently, there are 26 members, uh, 16 of them ISP networks, um, three of them uh, being internet or gateway backbone providers, which is an unusual term, but based on the licensing structure that we have in the country, it means these are people who are allowed to give you connectivity outside the boundaries, uh, the, the, uh, the boundaries of the country. And then we have the government through the Revenue Authority. We have the Research and Education Network, which provides connectivity to the academic institutions, the CCTLD. 
And we have some very interesting licensing structures which are currently under review. We had people call local loop operators who are allowed to give you uh, voice and data connection within your city or region, uh, the town that you are in, and can't give you connectivity uh, or the same thing uh, in another city. And so they also came in for the data pairing and voice, the, the one commercial bank and the more, two mobile operators. And as we get more mobile operators being licensed and coming into play, we expect them to also come and join in the pairing. And the value-added services we have at uh, the KXP, we have F and J root, we have .com and .net uh, TLD root servers, we have um, the .ke CCTLD, and also 25 other CCTLDs are available at the exchange through the PCH Anycast network. We have an NTP server and some root views. So all this really just add value to why somebody really needs to come and peer at the exchange point, and it's very attractive, especially for incumbents who have uh, a whole lot of traffic. So for the DNS side, it's quite useful to them. Um, our growth as a result of that has sort of grown quite interestingly. Between 2004 and 2005, we had a 77.8% growth. Uh, we almost doubled that in 2005, 2006. And uh, we sort of was tried to find a stabling point between 2006, 2007 at 110. And uh, some of the things which we realized were of interest during these periods were like some content providers who started peering uh, would provide uh, free SMSs during uh, Valentine's Day. So you, the cost of SMS was pretty high at the time. It was about five Kenya shillings per message. And on Valentine's Day, they just said, you know, you have 10 SMSs to do for free. And so you get quite a good number of people. And I, this is actually traffic specifically to their website, not to the entire exchange point. But you'll notice on this day, uh, on the afternoon of Valentine's Day after one o'clock, um, you know, normally their traffic was at about 2.8, and it automatically shot to just about six megs, and people just sending uh, 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 SMSs. Unfortunately, the company shut down, which was quite a pity, and but it was quite an interesting uh, effect. And another thing is e-government services, where you get um, the the national results um, uh, 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 were announced. Um, it's a big thing to do your. Um, um, what we call them um, uh, high, to finish uh, the last year of high school. And um, it's a national exam and it's announced and you know you get to know whether you go to university or not. And so once the announcement was made and they put it up on the website, it was hosted at one of the local ISPs, we just observed that the traffic at the exchange point really went up on the days that they actually announced that. Uh, it's normally announced around lunchtime, so you get to hear that on the radios. And that afternoon, basically, you can just tell from the traffic, it just really went up. And the next day after that, so from Wednesday lunchtime up to the next two days, you could actually notice the high level of traffic. So the, some of those uh, content uh, related, relevant content uh, that gets generated as a result. Uh, Sebastian mentioned about Google, and um, I want to highlight Google has been one of the large contributors of traffic growth at the exchange point as well. They're appearing at the Kenyan uh, internet exchange point through one of the members. And um, you can see that the traffic is normally at about uh, over 60 meg. But when they shut down, uh, just for uh, maintenance or something, you can see the difference there. We pretty much come to about 40 or 35 meg of traffic. Um, and that's just an impact to show you that how much traffic Google is contributing by virtue of being at the exchange point. So our stats this year have been quite uh, good so far. Um, I have to say that I feel good, <laughs> and I hope that we're able to keep this trend over the coming years. And basically, the, 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 main, in, in the main issue here is to try and make your exchange point as attractive as possible to all players. So the, the, the more attractive your exchange point becomes, the more traffic you get to, to exchange. And the attractiveness is based on the decisions the, uh, with regard to policy, with regards to the value add that they find at the exchange point. And that's, and that's what really drives the exchange point to grow. And with that, I think I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Machuki. Um, the speakers have been very good in keeping to time. So we've actually got about 40 minutes. 
uh, for questions. So um, I guess we've got a roving mic. Uh, I see a gentleman there in the back and then a second question there. Um, and a third, no, right, right at the back was the first gentleman and I'll take your question third, sir. Could you please identify yourself and if you like your affiliation and let us know who the question is for. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, this is Mitra from IQAPT India. Uh, thank you to all panelists for giving a nice presentation. And uh, I'm especially thankful to Ms. Salam for giving a very good presentation on the Lab Lebanon, what ISP, uh, ISP is uh, doing. But ma'am, you, what you said in that model, that there is no broadband and the speed is up to one Mbps. Actually, in India, we go for 256 Mbps as a broadband. So what do you actually say that with uh, one Mbps means it is a maximum up to one Mbps, the speed? And the uh, second thing I would like to know whether it is a wireless or wireline connectivity. Uh, you also said that uh, internet is uh, very costly over there as uh, some uh, 300, uh, I do not know, dollar or uh, your currency. Then what, what is the uh, ARPU, if it is so, uh, average revenue per user? And the, whether the user is a uh, major user is a government or it is a public? So this was coming in my mind, I thought that I will ask. Then my second question is to Mr. Mawangi. You have given a very good presentation on the, uh, in the, your country, whatever the ISP is doing. And especially, uh, uh, the, uh, you have given that uh, value-added service, which in uh, uh, free SMS on Valentine's Day, it is appreciable. But I would like to know whether you, along with the SMS, whether you pass the, com uh, means the commercial activity is also there, means uh, advertisement is also being given or it is just normal SMS. So thank you. I, I think like we better take those questions you. before we forget where the starting point was. Salam. Yes, uh, I will ask you because there is, I think, more than one question. So the first question is, uh, in, in Lebanon, resident could have through the newly introduced DSL up to one megabit. So one megabit is the maximum speed we get through DSL. And also one megabit is the maximum speed we get through wireless network. And it's about $70 per month for a resident. Now for businesses we wanting to connect to each other through E1 lines nationally, like within Lebanon, the E1 line or, you know, the E1 line uh, sells for about $3,000 a month. Okay, that, that, does that answer your first question? Okay, so what was the second question? <laughs> So were you asking about if ISPs made a lot of money? What, was that the question? Okay, ISPs don't make a lot of money. I mean, at least uh, not uh, the kind of money that uh, they should do because of there is very much uh, regulatory conditions that does not allow them to roll fiber. And for ev so they only are uh, able to operate wireless connections. And for every wireless connection they use, then they have to pay 15% uh, to the government in lieu of buying the fiber, right? So you want a connection from point A to point B, the, the government would say that's fiber or it's too expensive for you or the government says it will take us six months to install that connection. So you will go to the internet service providers, the private ones, they will give you a microwave link uh, the next day or two days after and for every uh, link they sell you, they have to give to the government 15% right off and then they have to pay 15% uh, the VAT or taxes, and then they have to, you know. So the, there's not a lot of uh, money in that. That's why there is a large, in Lebanon, a large uh, illegal market. Actually, it's not really illegal because everybody knows they exist. The government knows they exist, and they, they allow them to operate. But, I mean, it's complicated. They just operate uh, like that, but they don't pay taxes, so. Okay, um, 
Your question, uh, whether the exchange point does provide value-added services on a commercial basis, and I, um, the, the, you do not want to do that. You will be quickly moving away from uh, the actual uh, uh, core function of the exchange point. What you want the exchange point to do is provide value-added services that improve in its own uh, the, the value by in terms of resilience to its members. That means it's actually adding value to members to come there and connect, find the service already available at the rate they are paying, and it actually adds value to their overall performance. That's the kind of value you want to add. If it's a value-added service that can have a commercial aspect, then that is an opportunity for somebody who should be a member of the exchange point to take up. So that's a kind of value that brings to the uh, is brought to the exchange point, like the you know the the free SMS website. That's uh, an opportunity for content or a premium service provider to give and become a member of the exchange point. So you want to be able to distinguish between a service that is for the exchange point and a service that is for a potential member of the exchange point. Uh, because that's how you maintain a neutral uh, relationship in the, within the community. Thanks, Michiki. The, the second question was the gentleman there in the middle with the um, blue shirt, I think, or I can't quite see, behind the camera. And just while the mic's moving to you, I Bill had a quick to comment. add so. something to what Michiki was saying, which is that the, the sole purpose of an internet exchange point is the, to allow its participating ISPs to generate more bandwidth at a lower cost. So anything that an IXP does that costs the ISPs more money is directly removing from its value, from its core value proposition. So the best exchange point is one that moves a lot of bits at a very low cost. Anything that increases the cost of participating at the IX is removing value. So there's two gentlemen sitting right next to each other that both have questions, so I'm going to take you both together. Okay. You, sir, could ask the first question and then the gentleman right in front of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, mine is uh, not really a question, but a contribution. Um, I'm pleased to announce that Malawi um, uh, Exchange Point came up last week. And so... We <laughs> um, we started uh, with three... Uh, ISP is pairing and we expect this to rise to uh, six by the end of the month. Um, we're doing this mostly ourselves, maybe that's why PCH hasn't picked it up. Um, uh, but we had uh, assistance, uh, some equipment assistance from KTH of uh, Sweden and I project uh, with the University of Malawi. Um, the ISP is hosted uh, uh, within the University of Malawi in Blanta, and it's coordinated by the Malawi Internet Service Providers Association, uh, which I chair. Um, being a young exchange point, we have many issues to resolve, and I'm pleased to listen to the variety of presentations that have been made today. Um, and we welcome input um, from the community, from experts, um, from suppliers. Um, we have many human capacity problems. We need to develop policy, we need equipment, uh, we need expertise in doing measurements um, and, and things like that. So maybe a request uh, to PCH to update the list <laughs> um, for 2008 and we're proud to be the only new one in 2008. It's an exciting time for us. Thanks. Uh, thank you. The, yes, the gentleman with the microphone in front. I, I have a forest of hands going up before me, so, um, sir, a, qu a, a, a quick question, please. Yes, uh, Adiel uh, from Afrinic. Um, I just have a question to the Kenya Exchange Point. Uh, have you been able to measure the impact of the exchange points on the cost of international traffic, international bandwidth? Um, what, how is the, the, the proportion of the bandwidth used to access the inter, uh, exchange points compared to the international bandwidth of the uh, member of the exchange point has changed uh, from the past few years that you are operating? Uh, that's, that's it. 
Chicky, um, if you write down the answer to that, and I might take one or two more questions and then we'll get answers to, because otherwise I, th I don't think we're going to give everyone a chance. So the gentleman here has been very patient um, there in the front. Myself, Ajatra Party from Nixie, uh, I have seen you have uh, many type of uh, members. So what are the benefits uh, like uh, I have seen one local loop type of your member. So what are the benefits you are giving to that member? I would like to know. And uh, uh, you are giving value added services like uh, hosting root servers. So are you charging something from your ISP members or from any members? I would like to know. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more question from whoever's nearest to you. Okay, Machiki, would you like to start? Yes, because I think they've all been directed at me. Um, okay, so the first one coming from Adil, um, whether we've had the opportunity to measure the impact of the exchange point with regards to how much international capacity the subscribers are buying today or in the last uh, few years. Um, well, unfortunately, not accurately. Uh, they have tried to do a study of how much bandwidth uh, that was a report done, I think, end of 2006. And it showed that the total capacity Kenya was buying by the uh, Initially, we started with 64s and 128 kilobits. Now, today, the lowest capacity I know at the exchange point is currently, I think, 256, and that's a very small uh, a service provider, uh, the largest putting in one gig uh, over the coming. Uh, actually, the infrastructure is in place. What is ready, waiting for them is that they've ordered for a router that has a gigabit interface, which is yet to be delivered, because they intend to do triple play. And that means they'll be selling uh, video, as w I mean, uh, TV, IPTV as well, through the exchange point. So I can say that that has been uh, changing. So the only measure I have currently is that the smallest provider is currently at 256 and everybody is majority of the people have a 1 meg and 10 meg uh, link to the exchange point. So I, I hope that gives you some sort of clarity in terms of where that, but that's an opportunity for us to research and find out. Um, in terms of um, the value we give members, uh, the local loop providers, well, um, what you can see here is an opportunity. One, the local loop providers ha are connecting to the exchange point to, to, to find the following values. One, um, connect to the uh, revenue authority. That's uh, because there are people who actually want to uh, connect that from home. Uh, they work with the clearing houses, and they want to provide that. Secondly, access to Google. Uh, it, it means they are saving traffic, as opposed to paying upstream tra uh, transit to Google, they're actually getting it at, for free. So they save on their costs of international bandwidth that should be going to Google, where most of the traffic is destined to be going. They also improve the quality of service when it comes to DNS resolutions because of having the root servers, the .com and .net. Um, they also have good access to the local registry, that is the .ke registry. And um, access for all email transactions, uh, basically local traffic, email, web browsing, to the local uh, com uh, internet community is basically not going through an expensive transit link, but is actually going through a pairing link, which is at, the, at, at, at just the fee they pay to the exchange point, basically, which is you know, $400 for a one meg link, for instance. So it's a lower bit uh, per bit uh, delivery cost. Um, in terms of um, we are not ch uh, charging ISPs to get access also to the root servers. Um, and uh, basically, that's 